A heads up, this episode of Play contains strong language. One day last summer, my producer Eloise and I made a sort of pilgrimage as part of this podcast. We took the subway from our office in Midtown down to St. Francis Xavier Church, which you heard about in the first episode. And then we walked farther down to Greenwich Village to the site of the old St. Vincent's Hospital. A friend was giving us a tour of what remains of this once iconic Catholic hospital, founded by the Sisters of Charity of New York. We were standing at the entrance of St. Vincent's Triangle Park, an island of green in the crosshairs of three hectic New York City streets. While we were taping, a tall man with silver hair hovered nearby. He clearly had something he wanted to tell us. I I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, My name is Tom Bernardin, and I've lived right over here since 1974. Okay, so I was a young man and grew up here. I like to think of myself as sort of the semi-curator of the park here. Tom takes his self-appointed job very seriously. I'm the jerk that goes up to people and say, with my camera, what don't you understand right here? No dogs are allowed. Because it really kills me, because you see families here with infants, and they want to go on the grass, you know. If they want the day we visited the park was like any other, with people cutting through on their commutes home from work, couples sitting on benches, and lots of dogs, much to Tom's annoyance. It's possible that many of the people who use this park don't realize it's a memorial to the more than 100,000 people who've died from AIDS-related complications in New York City alone, and to the hospital that served them. Visually, it's not all that clear. Most of the buildings surrounding the park that were once part of this hospital, they've been converted into multi-million dollar condos. But there are some small visual reminders of what this place once was. A sign above a doorway reads, Nurse's Entrance with a sculpture of a Sister of Charity dressed in a signature bonnet. Etched above the main entrance in another building is a sign that reads, St. Vincent's Hospital. Tom knows all about it. It just is Sisters of Charity. (coughs) All right, I'll tell you something. 1822, there's a a diphtheria epidemic, cholera epidemic in Lower Manhattan, south of Wall Street. The mayor at the time says... Tom is a character. He knows his history. I found out later on, he's actually a local tour guide. He tells us that the hospital was founded by the Sisters of Charity of New York in 1849. There, the sisters took care of victims from a massive cholera epidemic. People who had been aboard the Titanic when it sank were taken here. Not far from the site of the Twin Towers, the hospital treated victims of 9-11. And in the 1980s, this Catholic hospital would become synonymous with caring for people with AIDS, especially lower-income gay men and drug users who couldn't afford the fancier private hospitals. Tom thought we were taping for a story about architecture or the park. We were actually doing a story about St. Vincent's. About what? St. Vincent's. Oh. So uh, actually, I would love to ask you what you remember about the hospital. Much much beloved establishment, all right? Uh, it, it, it was almost too popular because any Catholics not in the neighborhood, if you were, if you were uh, Dominican Catholic or Puerto Rican Catholic, you would gravitate towards a Catholic hospital. So it was really overwhelmed. I asked him what it was like to live here during the AIDS crisis. I lost all my friends. All right, you understand I'm 24 when I move in here, I'm 70. Uh, So this was, this was Auschwitz. This was a concentration camp opening up. You don't see that anymore. You don't see skeletons with the KS and you don't see that anymore, but my God. What what did the hospital mean to you at that time? Oh, the hospital, they were, they were there. They were there. Tom dropped the F-word a few times when describing how sterile he finds the area today. 
complaining that all the eclectic people that make New York, New York, were priced out. He had a few not-so-nice things to say about the Catholic Church, too, mostly about money. But Tom knew another story. He knew AIDS patients who were treated at St. Vincent's back in the 80s. Many close friends of his died from AIDS-related complications. And yet here he was telling complete strangers how much he admired the Catholic sisters who ran the hospital, who cared for the sick, when few others seemed to bother. That's what this episode is about today. Remember, the gay community back then was routinely protesting the Catholic Church. So how did this old Catholic hospital become a haven for gay men during the AIDS crisis? From America Media, I'm Michael O'Loughlin. This is Plague, untold stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church. As someone who's gay and Catholic, I wanted to learn how people before me have managed this sometimes difficult identity. No time in modern history has been more volatile for gay Catholics than the height of the AIDS epidemic. So I've spent the last few years interviewing people who are right in the middle of it. People who fought, worked, and grieved through it. More after the break. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org. There was some, as there always is, very activist, some would say radical, people for whom we were never doing enough. That's Sister Karen Helfenstein. She trained as a nurse at St. Vincent's. She once oversaw St. Vincent's entire emergency department. And during the AIDS crisis, she was a top hospital administrator. She talked about the activists who protested the hospital. And one of the things they learned was that the Catholic bishops did not want the use of condoms in Catholic hospitals or health services. If it's jarring to hear a Catholic sister talk about condoms, it shouldn't be. Sister Karen worked in the hospital during the AIDS epidemic with many other Sisters of Charity. This inevitably led to frank conversations about how the virus was spread through certain body fluids. Doctors said the best way to slow the spread of HIV was through the use of condoms. This posed a special challenge for Catholic hospitals. The Catholic Church teaches that sex should be reserved for a married man and woman always open to life. That means no condoms. Some Catholic ethicists at the time noted that using condoms to prevent the spread of HIV was something different than birth control. But church leaders in New York stood firm. Condoms could not be distributed in Catholic health care centers. And that rule sometimes made Sister Karen's job challenging. I was vice president for Mission at St. Vincent's, and my friend would call it Mission Impossible. That meant it fell to Sister Karen to make sure the hospital carried out its mission, which included serving the poor while also respecting the rules laid out by the church around sexual ethics. Uh, During the beginnings and in the heat of the AIDS crisis, there were very um, activist doctors, social workers, professionals who were attracted to come and work at St. Vincent's. And they wanted to minister, provide care for members of the gay and lesbian community. Lots of these doctors and nurses and social workers were Catholic. And at the AIDS clinic, lots of them were also gay. And nearly everyone had an opinion on how to best respond to the AIDS crisis. One night in September 1989, simmering tension between gay activists and the Catholic hospital had boiled over. Members of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, had organized a huge protest at the hospital. So they really took over the emergency room waiting area one evening 
and would not go, and our, serv- our security people couldn't uh, handle it, so the police had to be called in. There actually were condoms on the hands of the risen Christ. This was the most memorable image of the protest, Jesus covered in condoms. And for that reason, you might think access to condoms was the subject of that particular action. But it wasn't. It was about much more than that, as we'll see a bit later. But it's still important to understand how St. Vincent's managed the clash over condoms. Part of the reason protesters were angry had to do with money. It was expensive to treat people with AIDS, especially people with no insurance. Eventually, state and federal governments began offering large grants and reimbursements for this kind of care, and Catholic hospitals and clinics received a lot of this government funding to treat people with AIDS. But they still didn't distribute or talk about condoms. This was a huge problem for some members of ACT UP. As we heard in the last episode, they said the church had policies that were killing gay people. Now, you might think Sister Karen would be furious, scandalized, or maybe shocked by the protest, but she wasn't. I really wasn't angry. I knew those people were struggling so, and I felt it was a cry for help, almost like a a suicide person would try to take pills, but know that they weren't taking the full dose that would take them over the edge. And that's really what I felt like, what are we doing that's not enough for these people. And is it possible for us to find out what their, their further issue is? Do you remember hearing from Cardinal O'Connor in the first episode? Because St. Vincent's was in New York, it fell under his jurisdiction. He visited lots of gay men with AIDS, but he also fought against civil protections for gays and lesbians. And that led to a lot of tension between him and the gay community. This also made Sister Karen's job pretty hard. We were a Catholic hospital under the auspices of perhaps the most conservative archbishop in the country, Cardinal John O'Connor. So he's a very compassionate man, very orthodox, very true to what the Catholic Church teaches. And sometimes there were rubs of varying degrees between those um, two uh, audiences, if you will, or players. By players, she means the gay men and their allies in ACT UP and the Cardinal and his supporters. And I was like the director with the baton, you know, like, how do we do this in this place at this time? I asked Sister Karen how the hospital handled the issues of condoms, all these factors considered. Carefully. We um, talked to the nurses and doctors who believed that their professional responsibilities included fully educating a patient about what they could do to protect themselves and their partners. I said, we will not keep good quality nurses and doctors if we try to prevent them. And that's our primary mission, to provide excellent care. So it was up to Sister Karen to convince the Cardinal that it was possible to do both, to stick to church teaching and to provide the best care for patients. Uh, what, was, what was that way? I worked very closely with um, a Monsignor, William Smith, who was an ethicist and always worked closely with Cardinal O'Connor. So he began to learn and understand, and we worked out ways that we could give people information for access to items that they needed. We had um, local pharmacies, that they could easily get, for instance, condoms. It was the spirit of let's make this work that would help St. Vincent's become what the gay community needed during the AIDS crisis. St. Vincent's attracted a lot of gay doctors and nurses. Probably the most well-known was Dr. Ramon Torres, who had moved from Puerto Rico to New York. He worked with people with HIV and AIDS, especially people who otherwise had trouble accessing treatment. His clinic became one of the best places in New York to get AIDS care. We were among the top, probably top two or three in the, in the city and probably in the state. Dr. Torres, who goes by Gabriel, became kind of a celebrity in his field. In a 2008 New York Magazine profile, Gabriel was credited with turning a, quote, conservative Catholic clinic into a leading research facility that saved thousands of lives. We probably serve one of the largest populations 
both downtown Manhattan, uh, since St. Vincent's in the basically the middle of the uh, gay hub of New York City, at least in, in those days. And also we got a lot of referrals for some of our programs from the outer boroughs. Gabriel oversaw dozens of doctors and nurses. His patient population was more diverse, especially compared to some of the private hospitals that treated wealthier people with AIDS. Under Gabriel's direction, the hospital sponsored dozens of drug trials. He brought in tens of millions of dollars a year in grant money. Eventually, AIDS patients would fill up a third of the entire hospital's beds. Gabriel wanted to slow the spread of HIV. And for him, part of that effort meant getting condoms to high-risk populations. Well, it became an issue with um, providing prevention services, especially to groups like homeless people. And homeless people cannot afford condoms, so you either have to give them to them or they won't use them. Gabriel didn't think the hospitals approved workarounds for providing condoms, like sending people to a pharmacy across the street, were good enough. It became a sort of moral, ethical issue for the person providing the care or the counseling. Um, so obviously we, we broke the law and we gave them under the table, and, um, even though we knew that we were running the risk of severe repercussions. Um, over the years, however, there was more of a tolerance and more of a, a sort of bending of the rules. And not that we were openly displaying condoms in some bowl outside our clinic, but we, w- there was definitely less of an adherence to uh, enforcing the law, let's say. It may have violated the hospital's policy, or laws, as Gabriel put it, but the compromise sort of worked for everyone involved. It was common knowledge that the doctors and nurses at St. Vincent's were illicitly handing out condoms at the hospital. Gabriel said he never felt like his job was in jeopardy, but there was some tension between medical staff and hospital administrators. To be clear, he doesn't mean Sister Karen. He said he vaguely remembers her, and he said he and his staff were free to practice medicine as they saw fit. Instead, he said there was a sense that the administrators, more broadly, did not want to bring too much attention to the hospital's AIDS work. It's a bit complicated. They were proud of Gabriel's clinic, but there were fears early on that if St. Vincent's was too closely associated with AIDS, it might scare away other patients. And, you know, ACT UP came and did their thing, and they put, you know, they made a a lot of noise, and they put condoms on the arms of Jesus Christ, there was the crucifixes that were in the in the ER walls. And, I mean, that was felt to be quite offensive by the uh, administration, and they got a lot of flack for it. Um, and then, of course, it translated to us because they wanted to know whether we had anything to do with it, which we didn't. The image of condoms on a cross was one of the first to come to mind for both Gabriel and Sister Karen when I asked about the protests at the hospital. But it doesn't tell the whole story. Condoms were available at the hospital's AIDS clinic anyway. That's what Gabriel said. And other doctors and nurses who worked at St. Vincent's told me the same thing. So what was ACT UP protesting? What, what did you make of the protests? I mean, it's, we were protesting things that were, I mean, real. I mean, even in a place like St. Vincent's, there was uh, a lot of homophobia, a lot of uh, HIV phobia, or phobia of something unknown that could be transmissible. Other people we interviewed also brought up this prejudice. The protests made it public. For them, this was very disgraceful that they were being uh, portrayed as, uh, you know, having these issues. And of course, then you have to deal with the aftermath. It's like, what are we going to do about it? That was the question that Sister Karen and her colleagues grappled with. Remember, people in ACT UP disagreed with Catholic teaching on a range of issues. But this ER protest wasn't about all that. It was about how employees at the Catholic hospital treated gay patients. We were at an ACT UP meeting, and um, we were hearing about some horror stories coming out of St. Vincent's Hospital. Jerry Wells was an ACT UP member who helped lead the protest. You heard from her in our first episode. She was raised Catholic and felt conflicted about joining the big St. Patrick's Cathedral protest. That took place a couple months after this ER protest. She was tough. She was a construction worker. She had been a cop. She knew St. Vincent's well. Her brother had died from AIDS. We were hearing a lot of ugly stories coming out of um, people's lovers dying or very sick and then not letting in their lovers to see them. 
um, security guards were being abusive towards gay people. In this interview she did with the ACT UP Oral History Project in 2007, Jerry acknowledges that ACT UP targeted the Catholic Church more broadly because of condoms. But that's not why she protested at St. Vincent's. I had no venom. I didn't hate any of these people. I just disagreed with them. Hundreds of people turned up to protest. It took place shortly after several gay men had been attacked at Wigstock, a drag festival held each Labor Day weekend. One of the victims was taken to St. Vincent's. He was dressed in drag, and he said some of the hospital staff referred to him as a prostitute. Others called him a faggot. His partner wasn't even allowed to accompany him to the ER. Still, not everybody in ACT UP agreed with Jerry's decision to storm the waiting room. At this point, a lot of ACT UP members had been raised Catholic, and some were still practicing. It's St. Vincent's Hospital. That's the Cardinal's baby, you know. So, you know, so there was a lot of mixed feelings about that. You know, it's like going after the church again. ACT UP had protested banks, pharmaceutical companies, politicians. But this was a hospital, a hospital where gay men were dying. Some ACT UP members were not keen about causing a scene. And some guy stood up and said, oh, no, that's like, you know, it's not a good thing to do. You know, it's a waste of time. And, you know, and I stood up. I was pissed off at that point. I said, you know what, St. Vincent's is a business, period. Anytime you're going to get bad press to a business, it's not a good thing. They'll hear us if we go over there. And we did. We all marched over there. Jerry and the other protesters weren't out to just create drama. They weren't interested in yelling and screaming, letting off some steam, and going home. And the last thing they wanted to do was to disturb patients. Jerry and the others wanted gay patients to be treated better. And even if she didn't love Jerry's tactics, Sister Karen and her boss, another sister of charity, at least agreed with the goal. The security officers wanted Sister Margaret, who was our administrator at the time, to press charges that people had violated our property and disrespected us and that and sister margaret sweeney was stellar and she said no we're not pressing charges we need to find out what these people's issues are we need to talk with them and we need to see what we can do learning from them what their needs are sister karen recognized that for all the medical care saint vincent's offered the gay community there was still room to grow when it came to the hospital's culture At one point, we were found by them not to have security guards that were sensitive to how the gay community behave. And sometimes publicly kissing at the doorway of the hospital was offensive to perhaps a young security guard who came from a a very um, fundamentalist religious background. They could hardly tolerate the view of that and thought that it was offensive to the hospital. Hospital administrators met with Jerry and other ACT UP members to figure out a way forward. We worked on changing the rules at St. Vincent's Hospital so where people, their lovers can get in and see them and had more say and people were treated with more respect. Um, We got what we wanted, you know, and we worked hard on that. Sister Karen explained part of that process. So we then had several of the staff, if not all of them probably, um, take part in a sensitivity training program for understanding better the gay and lesbian lifestyle and the need to support them in there. And these people are simply grieving and helping each other through a terrible time in their life. Memories of profound grief from that time have stayed with Sister Karen. It was was a time that you can hardly explain because it was filled with pain and disbelief that we're here. And we saw whole apartment buildings where there were partners left. And they would, you know, begin by going home to feed the cat and get the mail and then help each other because someone upstairs was in the hospital. And then when the second partner became ill, it was that whole gay men's health crisis that moved in and got volunteers to get the mail and go in and feed the cat and take care of their final affairs. So you were, 
you, it wasn't numb, but it was like, it was just like unbelievable. And, and what can we learn to do better tomorrow? There's no question that placing condoms on an image of the risen Christ was meant to attract attention, even to offend. And some people certainly were offended, including the security guard who wanted to press charges. But the sisters responded differently, asking, what would make someone do this? And the protest, well, it seemed to get results. This is Gabriel again. Um, a protest is made and so that problems can be addressed and resolved. And... Um, I mean, to some degree, it helped. It brought more attention to the hospital and its HIV program. So overall, it it was effective, I think. Did you see the environment get better over the course of uh, when the crisis was going on? I think, yes. I think over the span of 14 years I was there, there was a, you know, gradual development of tolerance and acceptance um, the nurses, for instance, were fabulous. I mean, the nursing staff at St. Vincent's were uh, among the best in the city, the physicians as well, the care providers. Yeah, and even among the administration, there, as the money came rolling in, obviously when we got grant-funded programs, the administration became more swayed in terms of uh, being kinder to us. Gabriel had issues with the Catholic Church. He didn't agree with its teaching on homosexuality, and he obviously disagreed with church leaders about the role of condoms in combating HIV. Funny enough, though, he said he never felt his job was in jeopardy over condoms. But he tells a story about one time when he did feel like he might be fired. He had bought a wooden cross for his clinic and hung it up, thinking he was upholding the Catholic character of the hospital. But he says he got in trouble because apparently there were rules about the right type of cross to hang. It had to be a crucifix. So he felt like even when he was trying his best to work with the church, they were still bound to clash. He called the whole experience silly. Still, Gabriel said St. Vincent's Catholic identity made it special. Uh, So I I was getting ready for the interview and I was reading um, an interview you did for an oral history project. Um, And there's just a quote I want to read to you and then ask you your thoughts on it Mm -hmm. now. Uh, You said at the time, uh, thank God the Catholic Church has been one of the few that has actually opened their arms, including Cardinal O'Connor, to immigrants in general, not HIV per se, and also to the homeless and to the poor. So I really feel happy that I'm in a Catholic institution for that reason. I'm curious what you think of that now. It's been a few years. I mean, I I agree with the statement. I mean, Catholics have a lot of issues related to their very strict dogma. But I mean, when it comes to disenfranchised people, the archdiocese have open their arms basically to those groups that have been neglected by other providers of care. I mean, I mean, we were the only ones with an immigrant program, with a very huge homeless program. I always felt that St. Vincent's had a, a, a very, um, I don't know, a altruistic sense of, of giving or, or providing care or without, you know, regards to financial income or status or creed or... It really, it really was a great place to work in. Um, the, the staff were wonderful. I spoke to several doctors and nurses, administrators and volunteers who worked at St. Vincent's in the 80s and 90s. They all said more or less the same thing. The hospital had its flaws, but many people there, including the sisters, worked to help the hospital overcome its bias and homophobia. Plus, they said the sisters working there really took care of their patients. We heard about one sister who snuck cigarettes to some of her patients. Another would buy birthday cakes and wedding cakes. They hosted Christmas parties on the AIDS ward, which included Jerry as a drag Santa and her friend playing Mrs. Claus. During our pilgrimage to St. Vincent's, I became strangely emotional. This is not common for me. But there was something about this space that felt hallowed, even sacred. It would have been easy to feel cynical. I had done some research about why the hospital closed. Today, that land is filled with expensive condos, two bedrooms costing millions. 
But as I walked through the neighborhood, I thought of the generation of people who spent their last days here. This is where some of them ate their last meals. Nurses, family, friends, and partners fed patients ice chips, gave them sponge baths. Sometimes they sang their favorite songs, prayed with them. Many visited their friends here, and a short while later, some became patients themselves. St. Vincent's was where so many people had their worst moments, but it was also a place where the gay community gathered to comfort one another, to mourn, and to organize. I can't imagine the fear that swept through the neighborhood. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a loved one dying in the hospital and not be allowed in to see him, or to be harassed, mocked, and ridiculed by hospital staff in the middle of such dark days. But as we wrapped up our visit, it was a beautiful evening in the early fall, the sun just beginning to set, I thought of something else. There weren't that many institutions that were respectful or hospitable to sick gay men in the 1980s. And the fact that St. Vincent's became a place where the LGBT community felt they could safely receive care, that moved me. It's not always easy to admit one's shortcomings, but the sisters who ran St. Vincent's did some soul searching. They didn't always get it right, but in the end they helped make things better. That's who they are. I want to give the last word to Tom Bernardin. He summed up the legacy of the Sisters of Charity so well. The only people to stay behind and take care of the dying and the sick at that epidemic were the Sisters of Charity following their Christian mission. On the next episode, the AIDS crisis from the perspective of a pastor figuring out how he can best respond to the overwhelming need he encounters. The whole thing was, was treated in the very beginning like leprosy. And people were, were pretty terrified. I was really scared too. Plague. Untold Stories of AIDS and the Catholic Church. It's a production of America Media. I'm your host, Michael O'Loughlin. This series was written and produced by me and Eloise Blondio. The executive producer is Sebastian Gomes. Thanks to the team at America Media who helped make this episode happen. Kerry Weber, Father Sam Sawyer, Tucker Redding, and Isabel Seneschal. Sound design by Rebecca Seidel. Original music by Christopher McCormick. Art by Sean Tripoli and Allison Hamilton. Parts of this episode were recorded in the William J. Loeschert Studio at America Media in New York. This podcast was made possible through the generosity of Mark A. McDermott and Yuval David, whose gift honors and supports all LGBTQ persons and allies, past and present. Special thanks to Robert David Sullivan, Jim Hubbard, Thomas Resnick, Dr. Chris Mills, and the Sisters of Charity of New York. For more about this episode, visit americamag.org slash plague. And let me know what you think by following me on Twitter at Mike O'Loughlin. That's M-I-K-E-O-L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org.